Neisner, a jewel in the crown of leisure locations. Its pristine forests, rugged shores and sparkling lagoons seduce tourists and locals each summer season. Sunny days see both residents and visitors whiling away long afternoons down at the waterfront. Some even come for a bit of fishing at the old pier. Three friends, Cheng, Yao and Sean, are fairly recent visitors to Neisner. It's December 2010 and the three businessmen have rented luxury properties in upmarket suburbs here. Like so many tourists, they've also come for a spot of fishing. But this is no ordinary fishing trip. This is to be the catch of a lifetime. arrived in Neisner in November 2010. Chuo Cheng from Hong Kong, Yu Wei Yao from Taiwan, and Sean Pakare Sami from his hometown, Port Elizabeth. In a town like Neisner, with its wealthy residents and well-heeled visitors, the businessmen, flush with cash, blend in easily. At the luxury apartment in the exclusive and private Neisner Keys, the men go unnoticed as they begin plotting the details of a bold and elaborate plan. It began with the purchase of a 45-foot sport fishing boat, the Toledo. Pakere Sami has negotiated the purchase from a broker in Cape Town. 700,000 Rand was paid for the boat in cash. The main feature of the boat they chose is its ability to travel long distances without returning to port. Bev Jones, a marine engineer from Cape Town, knows the Toledo well. Being a marine engineer, I looked after the boat all the time it was in Arpe. Whenever anything went wrong, I'd get a call from the owner and I'd go out and fix whatever was needed fixing. She was actually a sports fishing vessel, mainly built for deep sea angling. That was her main function. We originally cutted the whole boat and refitted it. We actually set the boat up to do um, charter fishing. Yeah, I fitted two 450 horsepower diesels brand new into her with new gear boxes, wiring, everything. The owner never skimmed on spending money on the boat. Whatever we wanted, we got fitted. Electronics, state of the art. The Toledo was then chartered to the quiet little harbor of Neisner. And we were a little naive in not seeing any fishing rods, you know, in rod holders or anything like that. But, uh, you know, we always take we always assume everybody to be honest here. <laughs> In comfortable seclusion, the men plan the fine details for an illicit rendezvous in the open sea. A ship will leave South America carrying contraband cargo. Toledo would then make her way out to sea to meet the ship and pick up a heavy load of narcotics. In the privacy of their luxurious accommodation, Cheng, Yao and Sean were able to liaise with their counterparts in China, finalizing the details of a highly sophisticated operation. The timing of this operation is crucial and the conditions must be perfect. 
they must first negotiate a narrow channel at the lagoon's mouth, guarded by sheer cliffs known as the Heads, an area well known for treacherous swells. The Nile Bay is actually an extremely tricky place to get in and out of, because on your starboard side as you enter, you've got a sandbar. So you've got to stick to the port side into the deep channel. And also it depends on the tide as you're coming in. And if you get pushed broadside on there, there's a good chance that you'll get rolled in that mouth of the heads. So it's not an easy thing to get in and out there out of Nazna. And then, when they're finally in the open sea, the men must synchronize their rendezvous precisely. If one imagines a ship steaming along, um, normal speed, 14, 15 knots, somewhere there, um, People on board have the plan to get rid of uh, whatever it is over the side so it can be recovered by a smaller vessel. Um, given calm conditions, it wouldn't be very hard for a launch from operating out of one of South Africa's uh, small harbours or from the beach to, uh, to locate packages thrown overboard. It comes from anywhere any time because these vessels sail all over and every vessel has a satellite phone system. All vessels have that. What you need, you need a boat that can go through the heads, you need a satellite telephone to be able to coordinate a rendezvous at sea, you need a GPS to guide you where you're going and you need a radio to be able to speak to the vessel and then there you are. They fueled up and got everything ready, and then they said they're off to sea after spending some time here. And uh, there was nothing, nothing suspicious about that, uh, you know, endeavour. Toledo is a pretty sound type of vessel that would allow you to get out in a lot of conditions, right? especially at a slack high tide. And in the months that they were here, our predominant wind is an easterly wind, so the swell is not that big as opposed to the winter swell. So with a little bit of patience on a 24 hour, 48 hour period, you more than likely can get to sea. For five days, the men will be at sea, watching, waiting for their ship carrying the lucrative cargo to come in. It could well have been a ship that was exercising its right of innocent passage to come through our waters, but at the same time, it wasn't innocent passage. It was up to nefarious business and somebody on that ship or several people on, the, on that ship uh, were busy throwing things overboard that could have been picked up by that, that launch. Or alternatively, the vessel slowed down and the launch actually came alongside, in which case everybody on that ship would be implicated in, in the crime. The Toledo fishermen must pinpoint and pick up the cargo which was thrown overboard from the mothership and is now floating at sea before the notoriously swift Agulis current moves it away from the drop-off point. If you make the drugs float on the water and you put a transponder or a beacon or something on it, obviously you're compromising the drugs. Other people can pick up that beacon or transponder signal as well, and you're putting your drugs at risk. But the crew is lucky. They've spotted the floating barrels.
During their five days at sea, they fish out 1,716 kilograms of uncut, pure cocaine, a net worth of almost 2 billion rand. In high spirits, the men turn back to port on the Toledo, which is built to carry the heavy load. Asna is strategically so wonderfully positioned, you have, but for the wonderful facilities where you can unload and offload whatever you want, you have this situation where it's nicely situated between Cape Town and Port Elizabeth. So the drugs get offloaded there and then the drugs get either pushed to Port Elizabeth where it moves up the road to Johannesburg or it goes down the road to Cape Town. It's just laid out for a very successful drug route. For the past five days, Neisner is abuzz with rumors. Suspicious behavior prior to the supposed fishing trip has piqued the interest of many locals, especially those living in the Neisner Keys. They watch every boat that comes in and how it maneuvers and whether the chap knows what he's doing in the maneuver and, oh, look how he's tying up that, you know, he, you can see he doesn't know what he's doing and, and, and I would never do it that way and uh, so forth, you know. Neisner journalist Anushka von Meck was on the scene in the summer of 2010. The boat, actually the Toledo, caught people's attention. It's because it was bumping into the side of the restaurant. They couldn't park it. They couldn't properly drive it. And it was too big for the Neisner Keys. And I mean, it was like bumping to the side and bumping to that side. And that's how they actually, I mean, got to see. But, you know, I mean, we've got to pay attention. What's going on here? And then somebody in the Nasnikis began to take those videotapes. And that's how the whole ball started rolling. Civic activist and blogger Mike Hampton also keeps a keen eye on the town's affairs. What happened with the Toledo is it docked at the Nasna Keys, and thankfully somebody in an opposite department was a little bit suspicious and then reported the activity uh, anonymously initially to the police. Uh, it wasn't something that the police actually encountered. It wasn't due to any efforts of theirs. Um, they might have claimed the credit in the beginning, but it was, in fact, um, you know, thanks to a vigilant citizen. The resident who lives opposite the men becomes increasingly suspicious. He decides to film the men. He informs the police, and they urge him to continue recording their activities whilst they begin their own surveillance. As far as yachts go, when we have a foreign yacht come in here, if they behave in any strange manner or anything, we have government departments that we are obliged to phone and report any strange uh, thing that we see. People come in and out at leisure without even being noticed. There's nothing. In Nines now, there's no even immigration or customs or police or nothing to check anything that comes in and out. The police decide to wait until the Toledo returns to harbour after the expedition in order to make the bust. They check the registration of the boat and discover it's owned by Sean Pakaresami. His name is well known to law enforcement authorities. Sean has a prior conviction for abalone smuggling. His colleague Cheng also has a prior conviction for the drug Mandrax. It was quite early in the morning and the boat came in and they opened the bridge for the vessel and the vessel went through. With the boat now moored in the Keys and the three men confident their home scot free, the police pounce. The next thing there was a large police presence around and the next thing people were running all over saying, have you heard the news? Because from the restaurants, you look straight across to where the vessel tied up and the large police presence with dogs and sniffer dogs and everything. And I was amazed at the number of policemen, you know, that suddenly came out of the, the hills sort of thing. I didn't know that we had that many policemen in this area. It was a bit of a worry. <laughs> the search exceeded all expectations. Two tons of pure cocaine worth two billion rand. 
but Captain Sean Pakere Sami has disappeared. Cheng and Yao are arrested. They deny any knowledge of illegal activity. A lot of citizens on the ground thought this was a big validation of what they'd been saying the whole time, that we had an unrestricted port and that Neisner was being used as one of the channels for heavy drugs through to Cape Town. Often from my office that sits on the first floor, I can see there are vessels that come in with strange flags. And those people come ashore and they visit the country at their leisure and then later they leave again and there was no administration done to check them in or out, all the stuff that they bring in and out. That is the pivot and the source of the problem. Two months after the drugs were found, investigating officers arrested Sean Pakare Sami at the South Africa-Mozambique border post. One of the biggest questions on the street is whether the police were actually involved uh, with drug smuggling and covering up for the guys on the Toledo and drug smugglers elsewhere in our town. Nobody understood why when they found out what a large shipment that they had just bust, that they didn't close the roads. I mean, it would be expected that would be the first thing they would do so nobody would escape. Authorities are sure this case bears the mark of an international syndicate. It's all within the same crime syndicates in the world. And that's what's happening. That is disturbing. That is a disturbing thing because where it started off as maybe opportunistic um, adventures, it's not like that anymore. It's seated within properly organized criminal syndicates that are funded, that are organized, that are managed. That is the disturbing part. According to the FBI, syndicate members are made to take an oath of silence to ensure that the organization is not exposed and they rely heavily on fear. The practice of dispatching hitmen internationally to reinforce this fear is not uncommon. Once the stuff is on the shore, whatever is arrested there, they are small fry. They are just like pawns to be played and replaced. If, they, if you take one of them out, another ten is ready to take his place. They, they might come from the east or the west or wherever, but they will be replaced in no time. They, they are not the dangerous people. They are the idiots that, that, that work for the dangerous people. That's who they are. Records of thousands of cell phone communication logs emerge. But the South African police's surveillance footage falls short of being admissible. Time settings on the camera were not made correctly and it is impossible to establish an accurate sequence of events. Radar records are seldom stored. To reconstruct the boat's movements in the past, investigators need to use other means. Certain navigational systems will allow the police to see where a vessel has been, the time that the vessel was there, the speed that the vessel was traveling at, and uh, the duration of the, the stopping uh, area. So they would have been able to do that. They would have been then been able to transfer that to a chart and plot all that information on a paper chart, uh, which would allow them to assess the situation. So normally one would think that these people would be out of traditional fishing uh, areas or what we call traffic zones where the boats would normally, you know, I would think they would stay out of those zones and that would help the police. Putting together all the evidence, investigators could finally prove that Cheng had arranged the rental of the properties where they stayed. Cheng, Yao and Sean had been in close contact for several months. While the surveillance footage was rejected, the drawbridge CCTV cameras had accurately recorded the comings and goings of Toledo, including her departure on December 5th and return on the 10th. The vessel then stood waiting as evidence. The court case took in the region of two years to come to fruition. And then the state then owned the boat because the boat had been impounded by the state and the boat came up for auction and various bidders bid for the boat and it was sold to the highest bidder. Thereafter, the owner then determined to, to fix the boat up and which is what's happening at present. So that's where we are today and hopefully it won't be too long before 
the Toledo is back on the high seas, fishing <laughs> for fish. <laughs> I wasn't surprised that it happened. We have a problem in South Africa where we have like eight open ports that are not manned, not policed, and they have beautiful facilities. It's a wonderful factor. I think if I had been a drug lord, this would have been the ultimate solution. It works wonderful. The, the routes are there. It's quick and easy. The consumption of illegal drugs in Nizna is a huge problem. Huge, but I wasn't. I wouldn't be thinking in terms of cocaine. That seems like um, a luxury drug. I mean, obviously it is everywhere. I would say Nisner's problem is mostly with tacopa. You know, people we having a problem with cars being um, broken into, the bulbs being stolen, that type of thing. But when this happened, we realized the. Nisner has now become part of the bigger picture as far as the huge influx of hardcore drugs. You know, as an activist, I have my ear quite closely to the ground and in different types of communities. I know rich people, I know poor people. I attend council meetings on a regular basis. And in all of these circumstances where they're actually public meetings, nobody is asking where the drugs are coming from and where they are going and whether there is a network on the garden routes. Because for it to exist, there has to be a network. It's going to continue. And the longer the authorities drag their feet on doing something like that, the longer it's going to carry on. And it's not only Neisner. Believe me, there are seven other ports like that as well. I think it was just one of those rare ones that came to the surface. I think it's been going on for a long time, and it's still going on, and it will go on. In the meantime, the drug lords are having a feast in our, in our, in our town. The South African coastline is still porous. On New Year's Day 2014, a beachgoer, a hundred kilometers from Neisner, discovers a blue barrel in the sand. Inside, it's full to the brim with cocaine. Cheng, Yao and Sean are serving terms ranging from 15 to 20 years in prison for trafficking in narcotics. Sean is doing hard time, literally a stone's throw away from their luxury house in Neisner.